welcome to the IdeaGen Global Leadership 2023 Summit live on IdeaGen TV. Today, I am honored and privileged to have with us Amir Dossel, founder and president of the Global Partnerships Forum. Amir, welcome. Thank you, George. I'm honored to be here. It's great. The amazing work you're doing to address the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And, and right back at you. Uh, we, it takes uh, each and every one of us to create the awareness and ultimately connect the dots to help to achieve these goals. And I'd like to begin this interview right off by asking you, what do you do at the Global Partnerships Forum? Thank you. Uh, so our, our mission is quite simple. Uh, we try and engage the private sector, public sector, civil society, and in fact, academia, and more importantly, philanthropists and social entrepreneurs to figure out ways of how we can accelerate progress on the sustainable development goals. As you know so well, because your mantra is the same, is about working together to do good in the process. So we try and engage uh, all of these smart people and guide them on ways of how they can invest in the sustainable development goals. It's not about charity. It's not about donations. It's really about seeing results that can create sustainable livelihoods. So we bring these uh, smart people together and guide them on how they can engage with the UN and how they can support the UN's agenda and also at the same time improve the bottom lines. So there's a kind of a social and an economic rate of return. Thank you. I love that. I love that results, results driven. Uh, and, and as long as I've known you, you've been results driven for these past decades. And Amir, where do you see the value of the sustainable development goals, these global goals, these 17 global goals? I know our global audience, we talk a lot about this understands that in 2015, all 193 member states came together unanimously, including the United States of America, to agree to these 17 global goals. Where do you see the value of these goals in helping shape your leadership outlook? So that's a very important point and a key point when it comes to achieving those goals. Uh, you know, when the goals were set in, we go back to the time when the MDGs were in place, the Millennium Development Goals, and we struggled with it. We could not, at the UN, find ways to communicate the message. The SDGs changed that, and for one simple reason, because the UN felt it was important to engage what we call non-state actors, private sector, civil society, academia, and experts around the world and to be guided by their ideas on how to achieve these goals. So at the end of the day, these goals don't belong to the UN. They belong to all of us. They are our goals. And we need to use those goals as a basis of our everyday lives. If you look at the issue of addressing poverty, addressing it, uh, the lacuna in education, the health gaps in the world, urbanization issues, environmental challenges, and so on. These are challenges which the business community faces, which the uh, development community faces, uh, the, the governments face, the public sector faces all the time. And the, the missing link at this point, I feel, is we need to demonstrate that there is a value proposition of investing in these goals because the private sector can benefit with, with that. Because it's, it's really purely about investing. It's about a rate of return on these goals. You invest in better health. If you inoculate and vaccination, vaccinate a child, the child learns better, grows up and earns better, becomes a member of society, and at the end of the day, becomes a good customer. The only difference is that Wall Street likes to see overnight returns. This takes a little bit longer. But the outcomes are the same better livelihoods from the world. You know, that it's so inspiring to he hear your description of the ROI, the ROI and the results, you know, results driven approach. And also the way you frame it, that these goals are not someone else's goals. These are all of our goals. 
And I think once somebody understands that, it then you then take ownership. That's the whole idea is that you have ownership. You're an individual, you're a leader, whoever you are, you can play a part in helping to own the goals and ultimately achieving those goals. And so the theme of this summit, global summit, is global leadership. Amir, you're a global leader, and we'd love to hear for our global audience, in your opinion, what are the most critical, the most pivotal qualities of a successful leader? I guess there are many different aspects one has to consider, but I feel uh, one of the most important ones is to be a compassionate leader, a leader who understands what his team expects and is able to deliver. And at the same time, who are we delivering the results to? So the leader has to consider not only the customers, not only the stakeholders in the supply chain, for example, but also the community at large. And some of the multinationals see this clearly and are using it. And you look at the likes of Coca-Cola, Pepsi, uh, the companies who are on the ground, Unilever, for example. They try and engage not only their customers, their suppliers, but also the community where they operate in, the families and, and the extended families and so on. So we have to think of ways of how we care for others and care along with good listening skills can go a long way to make people appreciate that what they're doing is important, that we're hearing them. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've always got to take everybody's views because then you would not, not be able to implement everything, but you take the best. And that concept of cream rises to the top can be utilized very easily. Incredible, incredible perspective. And so these leaders uh, should and must in many instances have a global mindset for their leadership today, and perhaps even more importantly, for the future. What is the importance of that? So you look at uh, people like Paul Polman, uh, former CEO of Unilever. What he tried to do was, well, I would uh, paraphrase, uh, build the DNA of the company around the SDGs. So any product developed and supplied, any services they provide, is based on the concept that we must be SDG driven, compassionately driven, and driven for results. It's not always easy, by the way, because not all companies lend themselves to that kind of a concept. But I would say, uh, barring a few sectors, you can apply that to anything, whether it is a foundry, it's a manufacturing concern, it's a supply chain, it's provided provision of goods or services. We can integrate the sustainability concept into it quite comfortably without losing focus on the bottom line. Uh, understandably, companies have a responsibility to the shareholders first. So to deliver well for the shareholders means caring for the community. And by caring for the community, you increase your business outreach. And when you increase the outreach, you improve your bottom line. Exactly, exactly. And so here we were in 2020, uh, looking at that 10 year, 10 year span to 2030. We are now at what someone referred to the other day in an interview as we're at the midterm. We're approaching the midterm, uh, seven and a half years. And uh, in your perspective, from where you sit at the Global Partnerships Forum as founder and president. What is the update that you can bring us on progress in helping achieve the global goals? George, you put it right. We are at the midterm mark. And I'm sorry to tell you, and I might be a little gloomy, we are woefully behind on the SDGs. When we launched the SDGs in 2015, UNCTAD, the UN Conference for Trade and Development, did a calculation saying that in order to achieve these 17 goals and 169 targets, we needed about two and a half trillion, trillion worth of investments. 
Well, COVID happened. And guess what? We are now set back well before 2015. Today, the UN has calculated that the figure is between five and seven trillion of investments every year. Now, that's not easy, actually, especially when we've not been able to achieve the original target of two and a half trillion. Nevertheless, I, I'm very comforted by the fact that the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Gutierrez, and uh, Amina Muhammad, who's the Deputy Secretary General, and by the way, she was the architect of those goals. So she has been leading a campaign to mobilize within the UN community of how to accelerate progress. But more importantly, she's been saying, we need to bring the private sector into this process. We need financiers to demonstrate the value proposition of investing in these goals. Otherwise, regrettably, we'll be struggling for many years to come. That's right. That's right. And in terms of your plans, the Global Partnerships Forum plans for 2023, I know you have a myriad of plans and you're just getting started in so many ways. What are your plans for this year as we start 2023? So we are actually, uh, right now, we are helping the United Nations launch their 10th, 10-year uh, uh, summit on the least developed countries. It's called the LDC 5 conference, which least developed countries 5 conference, 5th conference, uh, it, which will take place in Doha in March. And that will bring together 48 leaders from the least developed countries. And there's a special private sector forum, and I, I'm very happy to share the information about that because I think that's where the lacuna is, that's where the gaps are to help the LDCs. And LDCs, actually, we should see it as an investment opportunity. We call them least developed countries. I would rather call them least discovered countries because there's an opportunity to do more there and get a high rate of return. And you invest a little in the education sector, little in the health sector or the environment, you get a lot better returns. And if you create those opportunities for those countries, mind you, we also need better governance, better transparency and accountability. Uh, and, and combined with that, you improve your chances of increasing your bottom line and also helping the poor. So that's our main focus at this point. Well, that's an incredible focus. And I love the way you describe least discovered countries. It, and it's true. It's, it's an investment opportunity. Um, if you're going to change the world or at least attempt to investing in these least discovered countries, and I will quote you from here on, Thank I will you. quote you on that. That is just incredibly inspiring. And, you know, Amir, I think you know this, words matter. Uh, so the words and the descriptions we use um, really truly make a difference in the perception and oftentimes perception becomes reality. So the direction and the and the focus and the impact that you're making is truly profound as I see it and so many others see it. And so I'd like to go in maybe a step further and ask you about partnerships. I know you are the embodiment of someone who believes in partnerships. Would you kindly describe for the millions of people across the planet that are watching this interview the value of partnerships from your vantage point in helping to achieve the 17 global goals. George, first of all, thank you so much for your kind words. I, I actually don't do anything. I'm privileged to learn from others. And that's the best part about it because building partnerships means you get to hear what the bright people are doing. And in a small way, you try and guide them a little bit channel their energy in ways where they can further accelerate the good process, if you like. Um, you asked about partnerships. You know, I have been living on a very simple mantra. Partnerships is about relationships. And if you build a good relationship with an individual, with an organization, with a company, you understand each other's cultures and you do it on the basis of humility, then 
you magic can happen actually at the end of the day because over the years we've learned many companies many foundations and uh, social entrepreneurs innovators who've come forward 99% of them come and say we have some ideas and we want some advice some of them will come saying i have the solution uh, and and here's how i can solve it but at the end of the day we need to listen to the stakeholders who we are catering for the people on the ground who are struggling so if we have good listening skills we hear what they want and then we develop solutions by bringing them into the process then things can change very rapidly uh, i have to give credit to ted turner when ted turner came to the united nations and he committed 1 billion dollars he was not prescriptive at all his idea was i would like to give this money to support social causes to support the humanitarian work of the un it was as you can imagine a godsend when a, a, a global media icon and a philanthropist and a humanitarian great humanitarian comes to the un and says i want to help it gave us that platform that new energy to engage our stakeholders and as a result of his efforts we doubled our investments in the poor from 1 billion to 2 billion and plus so we're very grateful to his philanthropy and his socially investment attitudes that's right and and clearly ted was um a visionary on many levels by doing that because those funds were truly leveraged to help create so much impact uh, as you said another billion dollars on top of that and it's not just about money it's also about the ideas and so it's helpful to have funding behind the ideas clearly but the ideas can spark change that no one can even fathom and we've seen it time and time again and so at the global partnership forum how do you develop all of these ideas into actionable pivotal change i wish i could take credit for anything that we do actually it's other people's ideas we try and mold and guide we're very fortunate to have a kind of a network of social entrepreneurs uh, investors people who want to make a difference people who are really doing great work and all they want to do is have a 10x or a 20x on top of it to see how they can do more and we try and marry them with an appropriate partner within the UN outside the UN and we try and guide them on how they can convert their social vision into an economic vision i often as you know george uh, 20 years ago people would call uh, call up and say i'm doing a lot of csr work i bought a table at a charitable event or i've donated 10000 for a scholarship program very good but actually you need to be investing widely and long term not just a one shot deal and we try and guide them on ways how they can create these sustainable livelihoods for the underprivileged because these underprivileged are the ones who do not know how to go about it who do not even know sometimes how to ask and they are in every society so we encourage people to look at their own backyards and help within their own close communities uplift those communities and then move to the next level. Incredible. It it's truly incredible and inspiring. And so now I'd like to focus a bit on you. A bit on you, Amir. Uh you have changed the lives of so many. I know that you're humble about all of the work you've done, but I'd like to call out the fact that you are personally um impacting and have impacted so many people. so many millions of people across the planet with your ability to develop these partnerships via your leadership and 
I'd love for you to chat and describe with our global audience a bit about your journey. And I have a second part to that, which is who most impacted your journey? Who, who is that, that individual? I know there are countless, but if I were to ask you one individual that changed the trajectory of your journey and impacted it, who is that? So I'll start with the second question. You know, once in a while you, you feel you've hit the jackpot. Uh, I, I feel I hit the jackpot many a times. Somehow I got into the UN. I, I managed to convince them that they needed me. It took them 25 years to get rid of me, by the way. And, and at the end of the day, I learned so much about how one can work together to make a difference. And I was really inspired by the late, great Secretary General Kofi Annan. He was a very humble man, very astute. He knew how to engage people. He would never, ever walk by people. He would stop, say hello to them, talk to them, hear what their issues were, ask for their guidance. And then a few days later, a few months later, a few weeks later, you'd hear, oh, he did this because you might have said something to him. So Kofi Annan was one of the greatest leaders, one of the most inspiring leaders and very soft spoken. And whenever he spoke, there was pin drop silence. And his ideas, his vision resonates not just within the UN house, but around the world. So he, he's been kind of instrumental in guiding us. And, and, I, and I have to say, uh, in, in response to your first question, I was very fortunate. I, I trained as a chartered accountant in the UK and I, I had a good job. I was financial controller of a civil engineering firm in London. But I also realized that I was not devoting my time for social good, for social change. And many a times I considered doing something totally different, working for a nonprofit or whatever. And then a couple of opportunities came about at the UN. And I was very lucky. It took me one year, by the way, to join the UN. And I was fortunate. I was given different opportunities in different sectors and finance, management, peacekeeping, reform of the UN, and then ultimately partnerships. And partnerships was finally, I found my calling where it was, it, it was, it's a, it's a big word and it's a small word. We, we, partnerships can mean many things to many people, but this was about partnerships for social good. Uh, how can we address the inequalities in our society? And I was thrown into that and I was I'm extremely fortunate that that gave us the opportunity to engage with many people from the outside. Because in the UN, we kind of are kind of insulated. We report to member states, to governments, because that's what the UN is. It's, it's a group of member states guiding the UN on how to implement certain initiatives, whether it's peace and security, human rights, humanitarian work, economic and social programs, but the UN decided it needed to open up to the private sector. So that was a turning point for us. And, in, uh, and although the UN has engaged with the private sector, the arrival of Ted Turner changed everything. So there you have another person who's an icon who has influenced my life. Thank you. Thank you for asking. You know, it is just awe inspiring to hear from your own perspective, your life's journey, uh, and those that have truly impacted you and truly impacted the work of the United Nations. And so as we conclude this incredible, prolific interview, what is your call to action for our global audience? And how can individuals across the planet find out more about this incredible work that you're doing at the Global Partnerships Forum. Thank you so much for asking. You know, the call to action is very simple. 
stop talking about the ills and take action. And what is action? You don't need to spend thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. You need to find ways of leveraging your expertise that can have a 10, 20, 100x multiplier. And you, you just need to start at home. We, um, our family, we, I'm very pleased to have wonderful family around me who overall attitude has been, we have it, we must share it. It's not ours. We are, we are actually temporary keepers of that, whatever we have. And it doesn't belong to others. We must give it back, give it back to society. It's like the old saying, what you reap from the ground, you must put back. What you sow, you must give back. So I would encourage people to look at what you can do within your own close environment, within your homes, within your business community. How can you conserve, if you like, uh, electricity? How can you help people with illnesses? Just a small act of kindness even can change people's lives. How can you educate an underprivileged child in your community? How can you address poverty? You can address poverty. You can say, I will give something for charity, but you can also teach a man how to fish. And that's what we try and encourage. I'm sorry, it's long winded approach, but there are multiple facets, facets to doing these small initiatives around, around your own sphere of life. Amir Dassel, founder and president, Global Partnerships Forum. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your inspiration. And thank you, most importantly, for all you're doing to change the world. George, thank you so much for having me. I can't uh, thank you enough. You're doing amazing work, and I look forward to seeing you back at the UN soon. Thank you so much, Amir. Thank you so very much. Thank you for the inspiration. Bless you.